Welcome to this web conference, uh, webcast. I'm really excited about being able to talk with you today about student-led IEPs. I've been conducting research related to self-determination and student-led IEPs for the last 10 years. And so this is, this is my love, this is my passion, uh, to talk about how to really empower students particularly within the high school and transition planning process when students are beginning to talk about where do they want to be as adults and our jobs as special educators or parents is to begin to help them realize those dreams. I want to accomplish three things in this webcast today. The first is I do want to give a little bit of spend a little time discussing the rationale for why we're doing this and just summarize some of the research and the theoretical underpinnings of student-led IEPs. But I won't bore, with, bore you with that for too long. Then I want to talk about the core component parts of student-led IEPs because if we're doing this well, it's more than just the meeting itself and more than just who makes the introductions in the meeting and who states the goals. So we'll talk about that a little bit and that will have, again, some basis in what's been happening in research and those research-based practices that support student-led IEPs. And third, I do want to talk about how do you do this? How do you begin to put this together? So we will spend some time talking first about the research and the theory, but then let's talk about how do you make this happen and how do you make this a reality. So what are student-led IEPs? We're talking about a process for developing individual education programs, or IEPs, in which the student is primarily responsible for determining his or her goals and objectives. Again, it's more than just what happens during that meeting itself, and we'll talk about that. Why are we doing this? Why should we change our process? This is a question that most folks have. We're used to doing IEPs in certain ways. We're used to looking at the legal requirements and understanding who needs to be there, what paperwork do we need to fill out. But if we are really going to think about how are we em empowering students in the process, we want to think about what really works. And so we need to look at our research and the theory from a major from multiple perspectives. We're looking at the psychology literature and just basic literature related to motivation. And what we find is that the more individuals are empowered or involved in making decisions and setting goals, the more likely they're going to meet those goals. And so we want to be sure that we tap into that motivation and that we use that to our advantage. And student-led IEPs obviously are a way to do that and to tap into that. From the field of education in general and special education in particular, the theory behind it also is, or the theory also reflects a need to change the practices so that students are part of the process and that they lead the role. Students report back to us in qualitative research studies that when they are more involved in the process, they understand it better, that they learn by doing. And so there isn't a way to empower them to make goals and decisions later on in life by just explaining how important it is to do it. They, get, they make the connection when they do it and they see it happening. Teachers and parents who participate in student-led IEPs um, as you know, for their son or daughter or for their young adult with a disability with whom they work, they say that this process helps them understand better the student preferences and interests and particularly their strengths. They see more examples of what the students can do and it helps us focus on building from strengths as opposed to just focusing on the weaknesses, which it's it, it's obviously important to understand the limitations that students have, but if all we're doing is focusing on that, we're really not moving them forward to where they want to be as adults and where they can be. And that brings back to that link between those long-term outcomes and annual goals and objectives. 
when uh, educational planning is done well, we have a set goal in mind, that long-term goal, those long-term objectives, and we plan those annual, um, annual goals to get there, to, to help us um, meet those long-term objectives. And so we can see that link more clearly when students are part of the process and are talking about what those long-term goals are. And then just student self-determination in general. The research is very clear on the link between high student self-determination and positive adult outcomes. Students are more likely to be employed. They're more likely to earn higher wages. They're more likely to live where they want to live when they have these high self-determination skills. And the other research shows that they do have improvements in self-determination skills when they participate in a student-led IEP process. And again, when that process reflects the entire process, not just what happens in the meeting. And we'll talk about that in more detail. Okay, so enough theory. What are we talking about when we say student-led IEPs? What's backed up by the research, but also what's backed up by some of the practices that we currently see happening around the country? This has been the focus of my research this past year. It's been collecting this information and trying to synthesize it to come up with what we're calling a fidelity instrument to really measure and really reflect what, do, what has to happen within a student-led IEP process and what are things that, if they happen, that's good, but um, they're not the essential characteristics. And this, we believe, is important because there are so many different ways of developing a student-led IEP. There are um, curriculum that you can buy that have packaged student-led IEP processes that are part of it. The Next Step curriculum, if you know that one by um, Halpern and his colleagues, um, Take Charge curriculum. Um, there are a number of them out there. And they have some core component skills or core components to them that are similar. And then they take them and they tweak them. And some of them are unique. Um, the Nietzsche website has a student-led IEP process that's on there, and we can get you that website as well. Um, that one really does lead students through the process of that meeting itself. But there are also other ways we can do it. Some folks use person-centered planning processes and have the student take a much more active role so that it really does become a student-led IEP planning process. And others have taken bits and pieces of some of those processes that are out there and have melded them together to create their own. So all of those are, are reasonable ways of implementing student-led IEPs, but what are the essential skills? And, and we want to look at that to, be, to make sure that if you're implementing something that you're really doing student-led IEPs and not a, um, not a hybrid that moves it into maybe more of a student-centered planning process. The majority of the research that we see focuses on the role of the student in the process and the fact that students need within the process to take a more active role in speaking about themselves and communicating information and communicating information in multiple ways. Um, communicating about their goals, both the long term and then the short term communicating about needed accommodations um, that they need to meet the goals as well as accommodations they need to participate in that student-led IEP process, communicate about their interests, communicate about developing those transition plans, and then academic placements. How often will they be um, spending time, how much percentage of time will they spend with their peers with or without disabilities, times that they'll be in the community versus on the school grounds, all of those kind of questions that are typically part of the IEP um, team process need to be first started with the student preferences and students communicating about that. The research shows lots of ways that we could facilitate or increase 
the role of the student, to support the role of the student in communicating all those things. Now again, we're not talking about the student communicating only, being the only one to communicate in the meeting, or going from speaking a little bit to speaking the majority of the time. Um, Martin and his colleagues in Oklahoma have used the Take Charge curriculum and have looked at student-led IEPs and have measured the percentage of times that students are actually communicating in the meeting. And their reflection, of, their research reflects that students went from a less than 1% of the time that the students were talking in a traditional IEP meeting to somewhere about 20% of the time. So a marked increase, but obviously not an increase that says that everyone else's opinions and contributions um, are diminished completely. We want to think about how to really increase that level of involvement for students. Accommodations really are um, the most supported examples in the research. Use of PowerPoint, use of other technology to help the students speak, to prepare what they're going to say ahead of time and bring it back into the meeting, using cues. In my own research, one parent acted as the cue for her son in the meeting, and they had a set uh, statement that she would make to bring him back to the topic to elicit his feedback about a new topic that he wanted to address in the meeting and to keep the keep it flowing and to keep the purpose keep his purpose on track as opposed to um, derailing that process or that um, focus for him. So there are a lot of different ways we can think about accommodating students. But we want to put that plan in place early enough that we have time to implement it. If we're going to use PowerPoints for students, we need time for them to develop those PowerPoints and put their, their voice or you know, their personality into it and put examples into it. Um, if we're going to use a cue, we want to have enough time for the students to learn to respond to that cue. And if we need rehearsal time, we need to have time for that. We can't plan this the day before the meeting. We need to put that plan in place and have enough time to implement it. And student involved in decision making, we want students to practice ahead of time how to take information, how to move with the information um, into a goal. So how do you look at assessment, how do you look at your long-term goals, and how do you translate that into an annual goal with short-term objectives? Now obviously we want to be sure that the student is participating in choosing the goals, that they agree with goals. Um, some of those may be non-negotiables. If you're going to graduate, you need to earn a certain number of credits, and that's just a reality. And again, with student-led IEPs and with self-determination in general, I want to dispel the myth that it means the student can do anything they want to do and there are no rules or policies or procedures that should or could be in place. In fact, it's the opposite. Part of the process of making decisions and choices and choosing those goals is really understanding clearly what the parameters are. What are the things that may limit your options to choose everything? Um, that's understanding your disability and how the disability impacts you. It's understanding the importance, importance of family um, in your own life. If family is going to disagree, if parents are going to disagree with your ideas or plans, how do you, how do you deal with that? What do you do with that? Um, and so we want, to, we want to focus on having the student choose the goals, but within that, helping them gather all the information they need in order to make those choices and set those goals. And while legally in IEPs, now with change, changes that have come up in IDEA, we don't need short-term goals. The students we work with need short-term goals. They need to break that annual, they have those annual goals broken down into measurable short-term objectives. And so within the process of this, the research is clear that we need to help them understand those short-term goals, break it down, 
and, fig and determine how they're going to assess their progress so they can see where they're going and then and we can stop or they can make decisions about when to say this goal, this annual goal isn't working for me, we need, we need to make some changes. There is some discussion as well in the literature about how to plan for meetings, how to think about all of the logistics that have to occur in order to make those meetings a reality, and the student's role within setting those logistics up. We want to be sure that the student has a chance to really understand what the meeting is, what the purpose is, and that they go into that meeting understanding that clearly. Um, mock meetings, practicing it, role, role playing, rehearsals, all of those terms are clear from the literature as effective strategies to use for this. Also discussions ahead of time with the teachers and so scaffolding, building on what they already know and then adding the layers to it. Another piece that students can help with with the logistics is planning who will be attending that meeting. And the first piece of that is understanding legally who has to be invited to the meeting, but then to begin to think about who are the other people who could help with the decision making. If a student wants a job in a healthcare field and as teachers and parents we don't know anything about the healthcare field, then we want to be sure that someone who understands that world is there or their information comes into the meeting in another way. Um, so beginning to think about what are the contributions that the team members who have to be there can make and then what are the contributions that we still need? What are, what are the sources of information we'll need to make decisions and how do we bring those people in? And then how to help the student identify the key people. There's a lot of assessment that happens right before the meeting, a lot of gathering of information as I call it, um, that comes into the meeting, that's shared in the meeting, and that is used as part of the decision making process to develop those IEP goals. And the student obviously should have a role in this as well. Again, there are assessments that have to be made, but there are other assessments that the student can participate in. And you know, one of the keys is in thinking about those long-term goals. If the student is like many of them who, who says at 18, I don't know what I want to be, I don't know where I want to live or what I want to do, then part of the assessment process should be before the meeting is discovering that and spending some time trying jobs out, doing job shadowing, talking with possible mentors, interviewing people. All of that career awareness that we know is so effective should become part of the assessment process and then that information brought into the meeting. The next few categories have less research backing them up but still still is a still are themes that come up in the literature and one of those is the role of of the parents in the meetings um, Morningstar Turnbull and Turnbull I believe back in 97 did a study they talked with students with disabilities about what really helps them be self-determined in the transition planning process and the majority of the students talked about the role that their parents play in helping them be self-determined, that it was really the backing of their parents or the support of their parents that empowered them to feel that they could make their own choices now. And so we want to be sure that while the student's role increases that we don't eliminate the role of the parent. Um, we want to think about how to do that. And a place to start with that is actually to talk with the student about what works with with you and your parents, what would help assure their involvement? What would their role be and how could you do it? Um, how could we communicate that with, the, with your parent? 
the parent also is going to provide some of that information in the meeting to talk about what their planned long-term involvement will be in supporting the student in meeting their transition goals. And so that information obviously needs to come to the table. The role of the teacher obviously changes, and probably this one changes as dramatically as the role of the student changes, because um, the teacher is not now the only person or the, major the person presenting the majority of the information. The student also needs to talk about what the role of the teacher would be, what would be the most helpful and supportive role. Um, and we've seen this in the, in the research and in our own experiences as coming in multiple ways. Um, one student asked the teacher to read half of the PowerPoint slides for him as that information was presented in the meeting. Another one asked the teacher to present all of the, all of the words. While the words were um, written by the student, he felt more comfortable if the teacher was the one actually saying it in the meeting. Obviously, the other piece is just in that preparation, that role, re the rehearsing, the discussion about what are the legal requirements for the meeting, what will happen. All of that needs to be part of the role and responsibility of the teacher. Category 7 is the role of the other professionals. It's really clear in watching IEPs, if you've watched IEPs as many times as I have, there's almost a culture to the IEP meetings. And most people who have participated, and the professionals have done this before, they've participated in these, in these meetings. They're used to their role in that typical culture. So we, need to really do, we really do need to spend some time with them to talk about how this is going to change, where it will be the same and where it will change, and prepare them for that, and to identify with the student how it makes sense for them to do it. One of, the, one of the students that we worked with in Indiana, um, as they started doing student-led IEPs and using PowerPoints, we found that the professionals viewed this as a nice addition to the meeting, but only an addition, um, you know, a, a first act, if you will. So they, everyone watched the student and looked at the PowerPoint and commented about how nice it was. And then they turned and went back to the meeting as they were typically used to having the meetings. And this teacher, Karen Thomas, did a nice job of changing, working with the students to change that culture and to even put a cue at the bottom of each of the students' slides that said, you know, a comment like, what do you think about that? Or do you have any questions that would cue the other folks in the meeting that, oh, this is their time now to talk and communicate about what their, um, what their part is. So when they talked about student strengths and weaknesses, and the student shared what he thought about himself, and then he said, well, what do you think about that? Then it was time for the speech therapist to share the results of the testing. And it was time for the job coach to share the result of what happened in the community. And it was a nice cue, and it kept the meeting flowing, and it kept it from being the PowerPoint and the student's involvement as being separate from the meat of the meeting. How we communicate with the students in the meeting is really important. And it's been reflected as well in the, in the literature that's out there. The key part of this, to, again, to summarize, is to really be sure that when we're talking with students that we're not directing their answers. And as special educators, we have a lot of strategies we use to set students up for success and to communicate with students. And a lot of those strategies actually are counterproductive to the student really voicing his or her own opinion. And so we have a lot of things like, um, you don't want a job as a, as a bartender, or do you want to live with your mom? And when the student says yes, you say, well, but do you want to live at home? And students learn that by, 
if teachers asked the same question a second time, it meant the first answer was wrong, so I better give a different answer. We have those nonverbal cues that we use as we communicate that tell the students what answer they should be giving. Um, we have close-ended questions, just a yes or no, as opposed to open-ended questions where students really could veer and, and express um, novel ideas and novel options other than, do you want to work in food service or with flowers? Um, when we say, where do you want to work, they have the option to say, I want to work in a hospital or I want to work at a grocery store, I want to work with animals, and so at that point, or in an airport, so at that point the, the options become more unlimited and we actually solicit their true opinion at that time as opposed to get them to answer the way we want them to or the way they answered it yesterday or two weeks ago when we first asked that question. The other piece we want to be sure is that we're using terminology and words that students can understand and that we are open to allow them to ask those questions if they don't understand. And then how we communicate about the student needs to be something we consider as well. We want to be sure that we use terms that really do describe the student and doesn't label them. So not the technical terms, but how does that disability impact them? When we're asked questions instead of the student, we want to be sure that we redirect it back to the student. So let's keep it from being a discussion about the student and more a dialogue with the student. And again, using the accommodations that really help the student be, in part, be part of it, that empower them check for meaning as, as students give us answers, wait long enough for responses, and keep that positive tone. It doesn't mean that we forget about the fact that they might have limitations or that meeting their dreams might, not, might be difficult. We want to do that, but let's talk about where can we go and how can we get there. The last category, which has less um, true research base to it, but really does fit with the practices that are currently occurring around the country, has to do with the allocation of resources. So once we talk about setting goals for students, and once we develop those IEPs in the meetings, we want to be sure that there actually are ways that those are going to be implemented. That if the student needs to be off campus, that there's transportation funding to get them there. That, there's, um, that there is a job coach or paraprofessional who could be with the student while they're at the job who could teach those job skills, or that there is um, an employer who has enough resources in order to provide that training themselves. We want to be sure that administrative policies, again, are flexible enough to allow the student to get where they need to be and to implement those IEP goals. The danger with student-led IEPs and the danger with self-determination in general is when we teach students how to have a voice and we give them the option to make choices, the problem comes when we don't have the way to allow them to make those a reality. And so we don't want to get into that situation. We want to be sure that the resources are there or that there's enough um, emphasis because it's written into an IEP, there's enough emphasis to make it a reality. Okay. So how, what does this mean in practice? How do we begin to pull all those pieces together and really implement a student-led IEP? I'm using a circle graphic to represent the student-led IEP process because it really is more than just the meeting, and it really should be something that, that does circle back around, that we prepare for a meeting, we have the meeting, we implement it, and we assess and evaluate how far we've come. And if it's not the student's last year of school, then we start the process again. 
before the meeting, we want to be sure that the tasks that we put on our <laughs> put on our plate that we address are the following five that we plan, that we schedule, that we practice, that we assess, and that we prepare. Some of the activities that support it, support those five, are conducting things like parent interviews, um, student interviews, observing the student, developing that summary of performance, um, present levels of performance, conducting additional assessments, and then this, the logistics of planning for the meeting, scheduling it, inviting the participate, uh, participants, rehearsing, organizing the information that comes in. Again, we don't need to reinvent the wheel in order to implement a student-led IEP process. Some of these tasks you're probably already doing. The question is, what additional tasks do you want to add so that you're making real the student's participation and the and actual leading of the meeting and leading the process? So if you're already interviewing students, if you're already observing what they're doing, how can you take that next step and get them to plan for the meeting and to choose who is going to be invited and to send out those invitations? How do you be sure that you're rehearsing and rehearsing adequately, putting those, putting those pieces and those components in place. Now again, you have a link to see this in large, to see a larger version of this. So if you need to do that to see it clearly, go ahead and do that. Um, this is a graphic representation of a student interview an interview related to transition outcomes. And this was done simply with Inspiration software, which is a very easy program for teachers to learn to use. It's pretty intuitive, um, but it does give you that graphic representation of what we're talking about and helps with the planning. So this, you would find a picture that was either similar to the student you're talking to, or you can import a picture of the student into that program. Um, to begin to talk about what's your vision and to talk about the vision for, a tr for an adult lifestyle that reflects all of the different transition planning areas um, that includes work, that includes the transportation to work or transportation um, for fun and leisure, that includes thinking about how are you going to keep your connection with your friends and build additional relationships as an adult. Um, what are you going to do for fun and recreation? Where are you going to live in the community? Are you going to go on for any post-secondary education? And what kinds of health care needs are you going to have as an adult and, plan and need to plan for? Again, these were graphic representations to cue the student to think about their um, adult lifestyle and their preferences in each of these areas. You could use, again, the actual pictures of the that the student wants to have in here. And then once they plan for work, you can import a graphic that represents what they'd like to do. So rather than generic money, um, if the job is working at an airport, it might be a picture of a, of a plane or it might be a picture of a specific airline. Um, if we're talking about transportation and their goal is not to take the bus but to learn to drive, then the car that they might like to purchase could go in there. So this is a, a way to keep it more real for the students and then a graphic representation that they can then bring into the meeting and use to share with others and could cue them as they're talking about what they want to do. So again, just one example. Not the only example, but something that has been useful both from the teacher perspective to keep the focus as well as the, par um, the student pr focus of how do, we, how do we do this, how do I think about it, and how do I make it real to communicate it in the meeting. And then the meeting itself. How do we think about putting those pieces in place? Usually one of the first things people talk about is having a list or an agenda 
that the student can follow and that the other participants in the meeting can follow in order to work through the meeting and in order to accomplish the objectives that need to be accomplished that day. Um, and this is just one example of it. Again, most of the curriculum that are out there that have student-led IEP components to them will have their own steps. If you look at the, um, at the NICHI student-led IEP guidelines, they have their own list of the steps of the meeting. Um, and so the steps are frequently things like introducing everyone, stating the purpose of the meeting. So if it's a student, student's transition IEP meeting, then talking about the fact that this is an annual meeting to discuss both annual goals and long-term transition goals. There's usually a component, again, if technology is being used, when it is introduced and how it will play into the meeting itself is discussed. So this is where, this is where the student would say, um, I'm going to share some information with you with power, on PowerPoint. I'm going to use a question such as, what do you think about that? And that's the time when I'd like you to share information that you're bringing to the meeting or again, whatever words work for that student, you want to talk about that and talk about with the student that you're going to use this to help them as a cue and help them remain focused. Talking about who you are and we want to be sure that the student understands that the purpose is to develop their educational goals, but the first place, is to, the first place to start is to begin to talk about who they are how the disability impacts them, their strengths, their limitations, to give a feel to the folks in the, on the team so that they can understand this person and who they are better. Then it's time to talk about those long-term goals. And again, we want to talk, do almost backward planning, so we're going to talk about where we want, where that person wants to be and then begin to talk about where they are currently and how we're going to get them closer. And then the annual goals. Most of the, again, most of the examples of student-led IEPs have students before, meeting, before the meeting preparing some of those goals ahead of time and bringing them into the meeting, knowing that the team is still going to discuss it and additional goals may be added or some of these may be eliminated in favor of other goals so but we need this as a starting point and so the student will talk about what those what those beginning annual goals are and then the next step obviously is to use the team process to develop the actual goals and the last step is to wrap up the meeting to thank people for being there and if necessary to talk about what the next steps would be This is another graphic, um, again, was used originally by Karen Thomas. Uh, her work related to student-led IEPs has really informed my practice and my research. And it, again, she uses technology well. She uses it in a way that students can understand and also keeps us focused and organized. So this is another example, again, using inspiration software. Inspiration has templates that are part of it, and one of the templates is used related to goal setting. And so this, this example uses that goal setting template and helps a student break it down. And so the first step of goal setting is to think about what do I already do well? So what's the current reality? And then the areas to develop what do I still need to do? What do I need to accomplish? And then based on that, what are the annual goals? So what are those goals that will get you to or will improve in those areas to develop or will get you closer to where you want to be? And then the last column are those resources. Because again, we're talking about student self-determination. We're not talking about student isolation or student doing it all themselves. 
So what are the technology resources? What are the people resources? What are the financial resources that are necessary for each of these? So this student, Kathy, um, already is able to talk with people well, does well with cooking, and is able to find time, time to go out with friends. But what she wants, what she has a difficult time with is being on time paying her bills and arranging transportation. So if one of her transition goals was to increase her recreation and leisure skills and find ways to go to concerts with friends, then one of them might be looking at how do you, how do you begin to think about how much time you need to get there on time and how do you arrange for the transportation you need in order to get there. Um, so pulling those together and the resources might be things like, you know, bus schedules and Quicken software to help with with budgeting and planning those things and maybe even um, a PDA that would give you access to student or friends phone numbers and would organize that information for you and organize your schedule so what are the resources that would work and be effective so again one example one example of a graphic way to do this with a student and bringing this into an IEP meeting helps the whole team begin to brainstorm as opposed to focusing unfortunately on just the limitations that the student has and feeling overwhelmed. So what happens after the meeting? We can have the best meeting in place, we can prepare the student, we can hold the meeting, we can write a beautiful student-led IEP plan, but if we don't implement it and if we don't evaluate student progress on it, then we don't have a beautiful plan and our, our time was wasted. So we want to be sure we're maximizing student involvement and time and our time in a way that makes sense. So we really do, again, want to focus on what happens after that meeting. The tasks we need to accomplish are we need to implement those goals and we need to involve students in the process as much as possible and we need to evaluate the effectiveness of that and that's again where those short-term goals help for students so that they can self-monitor their progress and they can use that information to decide what to do about their effectiveness or their their um, ability to meet those goals. Summarizing the progress, we need some way to share that information, not just with the student and the teacher, but to share it with other team members. We need a process for making changes as necessary, and if necessary, reconvening that meeting. So how do we, how do we decide when it's time to bring that entire team back to the table? When we're not working on goals, when goals aren't being effectively implemented, resources that we thought were there aren't there. When is it time to bring those, those stakeholders back to the table? And when is it okay to make decisions, um, for the student to make their own decisions, or when does the student and the teacher alone with parent input can make those decisions? So we want students to understand that process. Again, I want to talk about those handouts that you have that are attached to this. You do have a copy of a PowerPoint slide show that students can use and can change in order to bring that information into the meeting. You can use the PowerPoint in the meeting itself or just use it to organize the student to share the key important pieces at that actual meeting. And again, if we think about the options with PowerPoint and moving it into the outline, it could be a way for the student to organize their progress on the goals or progress in assessments later that inform, will inform the next round as the cycle continues. You also have a student or the self-determined learning model of instruction. You have that flow chart. This was developed um, as a way to teach students how to solve problems 
and solve problems as they're learning self-determination skills in multiple settings. This also could be used as a, as a way to involve students in their IEP meeting. So the problem is, what goals do you want to set? And walking them through that process as well. And then what's nice about that model is it also gives students steps and questions to ask to evaluate their progress on meeting and implementing those goals. So even pulling that component out of it and using it with another IEP or student-led IEP process it can involve students in that, that third part of the cycle of evaluating progress. So that is a resource for you to use. Again, you also have those images um, from today, those inspiration images. And then I really do want to direct you to the Nietzsche website, which is www.nichy.org. And under their publications section, there is a student guide helping students develop their IEPs. There's a guide that walks teachers step by step. It really does focus on what happens in that meeting itself, um, but it is a way to start and to begin to make the changes at that, in that part of the cycle. There's also under that publications, there's a guide that you can use directly with students, again, to help them think about what are the legal requirements for this process and what their role could be in the meeting and how to begin to have a say in changes that will be made and implementation of the process. So we've given you a lot of information today, or I have shared a lot of information from the literature and from um, the theoretical underpinnings, and then some examples of how this has been and can be implemented by you in the classroom. I will take questions from you um, and answer those questions. Obviously, this isn't enough time to go into as much depth as we, as we need to, but these resources were, will be a way for you to begin to think about what do you currently do and what, do you, what changes you need to make in order to implement a student-led IEP process in your, in your own classroom for the students with whom you work. I wish you well. Your efforts are necessary. They are, if they're focused, they will result in better outcomes for your students. And so what you're doing really will make a difference in the lives of the students with whom you work. Thank you.